we tend, by a secret law of the soul, to move towards our mental image of God. What do you think about when you think about God? The answer could not be more important for an individual person and for us as a society, for an individual Christian and for us as a church. And it means that what really matters is what we think about God in the deepest recesses of our head and our heart. That matters more than what our church statement of faith might say. That matters more than what we might say about God when we're asked about Him. Because we tend towards what we truly believe about God. Whether you have believed in God for a lifetime, or whether you're not sure if you do, who do you think God is? there could be no more important question. So this is God, an introduction. Hi, it's great to see you all. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Chris, and it's my joy to lead the team here. And uh, I just want to just thank God for what he's doing. I mean, what an amazing thing, just coming to church, seeing everybody. We've taken that for granted for too long, haven't we? And, 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 and to hear all the exciting things that God is up to. I mean, it's just incredible. Well done. And, uh, and can I just say a couple of thank yous as well? Thank you for giving so generously at the gift days. I mean, it literally bowls me over to see the faith and the generosity. I mean, another 51 plus thousand pounds towards the work of God. Here in the city. I mean, why don't you give yourselves a huge round of applause for that? Come on. That's just incredible. Thank the Lord. Lord, we're grateful. We are so grateful. Um, I, I've missed you. I've not been here at the college for a few weeks. I, uh, um, let me tell you, where have I been? I was down at um, Christ Church in Fareham one week. They, uh, they were a new church plant three years ago. Uh, and I was there a few weeks ago to lay hands on their new eldership team. So it's now officially a church. We have a church in Fareham, Christ Church Fareham, and a great team of elders and wives there. So that was a real blessing to be a part in that and to see something grow from a, a few pioneers moving out to, to a wonderful new work. And then uh, the f week following that, I was with our church in Eastleigh, Junction Church. You may know that we're bringing some support and encouragement to them. Some of our worship leaders have been serving there. I'm preaching there maybe once every five or six weeks, uh, just to strengthen and help and serve them. And they're really appreciating that. And they're doing well. And then last week I was with our West End guys. So it was lovely to be there too and to see God at work there. Uh, so that's fantastic. And I'm excited about the move to King Edwards. In fact, we've got this Sunday. So this is one Sunday. We've got one more Sunday after this Sunday. And then we're there. I mean, that's amazing. And I've walked around the facilities. and Wow. It's definitely, definitely a step up. It's just, I'm really looking forward to being there. But, but let me get into the Bible, because we, we've got this privilege, haven't we, of unpacking God's living word to us. And so I just want to pray, and then uh, let's open it up and see what God wants to say to us today. It's his voice we need. Lord, we, we thank you, <laughs> Lord, for all the good news, for all the amazing things you're doing, all the things we've been singing about and worshipping you for. And we pray as we come to your word that you just be with us by your Holy Spirit, illuminating it, igniting it in our lives, helping the truth to be revealed to us by your Holy Spirit's active presence on this precious, precious word. We love you for giving it to us, Lord, and we want our ears to be pinned back to hear what you want to say to us today. Amen. Amen. Um, so, we're looking at this series, God, an introduction. Really, it's a series about doctrine. It's a series about who God is. It's looking at the nitty-gritty of the God that we worship. And this is really important stuff. Because people all over the globe will, uh, you know, from many, many different faiths, will all claim to worship and follow God. That word, God. But what they mean by that word, God, can mean very different things. So when I visit our church in Nepal, the nation's religious scene is obviously very, very different to here. 81% Hindu, 9% Buddhist, so that takes care of 90% of the faith in the country. 4% Islam. Christians represent just 1.4%. There are twice as many Kirat Mundum believers in Nepal than there are Christians, and you've probably never even heard of Kirat Mundum. 
Kiritmundam is a form of pre-Hindu shamanism where basically they worship Mother Nature, they worship the sun and the moon and the rain, and interestingly, they also worship the main pillar in their house. I found that quite fascinating in Kurat Mindam. They worship the main pillar in their house. Interesting, isn't it? Well, there you go. But you see, in Hinduism and Buddhism, there are many, many gods, all different, but they all have a common denominator. At the root of them all is a combination of power and fear. So I was walking along a Himalayan riverside with my friend John Pradhan, who is Nepali by birth and um, grown up in northeast India. And I was asking him a question. I, I said to him, can you tell me, John, when I look at all the, the Hindu representations of gods, why are they always so, so garish and scary and, and, and ugly, to be frank? You know, there's nothing particularly attractive about them when I look at them. And he said, it's because they're all rooted in power and fear. So in Hinduism, the basic principle is this. We look for where power is, and then we attribute it to the divine, and then we have to make a, an image to represent that. So, uh, you know, in times gone by, a person would be walking along this river, perhaps, the one I was walking alongside, see the raging river and the you know, the force of it. And they say, wow, that's a, that's a powerful river. God must be in that river. And then they need to worship that God, so they need a, an image to worship. So they create something that looks powerful and fearful. And then, you know, it might be the same if they see a huge elephant. They might look at an elephant and say, wow, that's a powerful elephant. God is in that elephant. We, how do we represent that? How do we show that? Or, or look at that, that mighty tree. That's bigger than all the other trees in the forest. God must be in that tree. And so they, then they create another God to be worshipped. And, and, and again, it's this combination of power and fear. And if the way that you view God is that he is powerful but dangerous and sometimes unpredictable and unkind and needing to be placated, then the way that you would relate to that God will always be with uncertainty and fear. In the way that a a fearful child might respond to a bully in the playground. Or a wife to a, an abusive husband. It's, it's, it's his way or else. And if that's the kind of relationship that we have with God, what we understand by God is vitally important. You know, even those of us that read the Bible and would, would, would hope that we've got a, a healthy understanding of God, we can still fall into an unbiblical view at times. And so there will be times when we, we, we end up being wary of him when we should be drawing close. Or we end up being irreverent when we should be, perhaps, in all. And so we can, all of us, fall into the trap of being overly familiar. And so what we need to understand is what the Bible says about the person of God is of fundamental importance. And that's what we're trying to catch a glimpse of in this series. What is the Christian God like? The God of the Bible, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Moses, the God who became flesh, who bore the name Jesus, who then suffered and died and was raised to new life to eternally love and have fellowship with those that he created and particularly those that believe in him, that carry the name of Christ. Now, some of you today will not carry the name of Christ yet. You will not yet be a Christian. That's fine. I want you to hear about this God. Some of you would say, yes, I am a Christian. I carry his name. Well, I want you to be clear about who it is you're believing on and believing in. And to get to know God better, we need to look at his character, and what theologians would call his attributes. And there are two distinct groups when it comes to trying to describe the character and the attributes of God. There's his incommunicable attributes and his communicable attributes. His incommunicable attributes, are they're the bits of God's character that are totally unlike us. So, for example, his omniscience, his knowing everything. Now, I might like to think I know everything, but in reality, I know that I don't know everything. So that's an attribute of God that he has that I can't have. Similarly, his omnipresence, God able to be present everywhere. Again, Joe, my wife, she might like me to be present everywhere, but I quite simply can't be. 
but God can be. You see, these are his incommunicable attributes. But then we have his communicable attributes. These are ways that God is that we can also increasingly be like him in, in terms of his mental and his moral character. Things like goodness or, or wisdom or mercy or peace or today's subject, love. Love. We need to start to define and describe what God is like. Do you know, in the Bible, there are 152 different designations or descriptions of God, how he is in terms of his character. And the Apostle John, arguably Jesus' closest friend, he gives us some deep insights into the nature of God. I want you, I want you to get your Bibles open, because we're going to have a look in here in 1 John chapter 4 in a moment. But John, the Apostle, he tells us several things about God. He tells us that God is spirit. He tells us that God is light. And in today's verses, in 1 John 4, he tells us that God is love. Now, you might say to me, well, that's obvious. Of course God is love. We know God is love. We know that. That's basic stuff. Well, can I just say, if that's the assumption you've made, you're wrong. The truth that God is love is the deepest well we could possibly dare to plumb. So a friend of mine, the theologian, Andrew Wilson, he said this, describing the love of God is like trying to rugby tackle a snooker table. You can give it your best shot, but ultimately it is far too big to get your arms around. Yeah? Well, Bishop Gore in 1939, he said that God's love is the hardest of all things to believe. But if you can believe that, you can believe everything else. One of my favourite theologians, A.W. Tozer, he said this, I can do no more justice to that awesome and wonder-filled theme than a child can grasp a star. You see, when we're talking about God's love, it is completely, unimaginably good. So with a little trepidation... Let's dig into three immense verses that begin to open the door a little bit on this vast landscape of the love of God. We can put the scripture up if that's okay. This is 1 John 4, and I'm going to read verses 8, 9, and 10. I've got one previous verse to this. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So three verses. And each one gives us a slightly different vista on the love of God. Verse 8 gives us the definition. God is love. Verse 9 gives us the demonstration. God sent his only son into the world as a demonstration of that love. And verse 10 gives us the description of what that looks like in practice. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us and became a sacrifice for us. So let's take those three themes, definition, demonstration, description, and dig in a little deeper to each verse. So definition. John says, God is love. We must be careful. Love doesn't define God. God defines love. So somebody said to me once, your truest identity is who you are when no one is watching. And if that is true, which I believe it to be true, then for eternity, God has been love. Before creation, God is love. When there is quite literally nothing there to love, God is love. He defines it, he is it, he embodies it. And in some respects, God's love doesn't even require an object. Because it's just about his identity, who he is. Yet love does somehow require an expression. So for all those eons of deep history... How did God express his identity? How did God demonstrate his love? How did he show it? If he just is love, irrespective of everything else, what did he do? How did he show it? Well, we get some clues in John's Gospel. 
Same John that was writing this letter. So John 17, verse 24, uh, Jesus the Son is describing his relationship with his Father. And he talks about, to the Father, about your love for me before the foundations of the world. And then the other way round, in John 14, 31, Jesus says this, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. So for all of deep history, the Father has been loving the Son and the Son has been loving the Father and both have been loving the Spirit. There has been this beautiful, perfect, eternal, Trinitarian love existing for all eternity. And the word love isn't eros. It's not romantic love. It's not sexual love. It's a different type of love. It's the word agape that you'll be familiar with. It's the kind of love that is pure. It's the kind of love that is giving rather than taking. It's, it's the kind of love that is sacrificial rather than simply emotional or physical. It's the kind of love that God defines. So if God defines love and he is the one who is eternally giving, eternally giving of himself, always for the benefit of others, then that shows us something about true love. It shows us what true love actually is. True love is sacrificial. True love is the giving of yourself for the benefit of others. So when you say, I love you, it's not because you give me a warm glow. What you're saying when you say to someone, I love you, is you're saying, I would give myself up for you. I would lay myself down for you, even unto death, for that was the example of Christ. I would die for you. That's what I love you means if we're using the word agape and the example of God's love. Just... For a moment, get really practical. Think about relationships. Think about dating. Think about marriage and that whole realm. You see, the world has come to confuse love with comfort and with pleasure. So we say we love someone when we feel good around them or when they make us feel important, when it feels easy, when it feels comfortable. Can I just say, sacrifice is not comfortable. Sacrifice isn't comfortable. It's painful. So girls, I say this. If a guy says he loves you, but he's not prepared to give up anything for you, that's not love. That's not love. If he's not prepared to put you first, that's not love. That's not God's definition of love. So if he's not giving anything up for you, he's got to shape up or ship out. <laughs> yeah? And married couples, many of you are married. The, the things that drew you together are never going to be the things that sustain you. Attraction draws you, but love sustains you. And by love, I mean sacrifice. Joe and I have been married for 28, 29 years. I'm terrible if I can't get it right. Anyway, can we edit that bit out? Joe and I have been married ever such a long time. And I can tell you, the only reason we're still married is because we both made the decision to sacrifice. Not to have our own way, but to give ourselves up for one another. I'm sure there have been times in our married life that she hasn't even liked me. But she has sacrificed, as have I. You see, we can either choose to demonstrate the unconditional agape, sacrificial love, or the fleeting eros love. Anyway. Not a sermon about relationships and marriage, but I just want you to understand how our view of God ends up being rooted in very practical day-to-day -day stuff of life. What we believe about God changes everything. So, definition, God is love, and it's this agape, sacrificial love, even to death. Let's move on to the second thing, demonstration, where verse 9 says, this is how God showed or demonstrated his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So love is not a feeling. Love is an action, and it has to be demonstrated. And in that verse, we get a clearer picture of how that perfect love that has existed forever within the Trinity is now demonstrated to us, how that perfect love of God begins to impact planet Earth and Southampton. That's what John says. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son 
into the world that we might live through him. Wow. I mean, what a verse of scripture. What a mighty verse. So just picture it for a moment. You've got the perfection of the Trinity eternally loving one another. No bickering, no selfishness, no one-upmanship, no comparison. And then something incredible happens. Noticing that humanity is sick. Noticing that humanity is sin-sick. Noting that humanity has become selfish and hard and is no longer a faithful representation of the love that had existed within the Trinity forever. And in the Godhead, the Father does the most incredible thing and he commissions the Son. And he says, Son, I want you to go into that. And I want you to restore what we've had. I want you to restore what we are. I want you to bring that back to this. I want you to leave the perfect and I want you to go to the imperfect. I want you to leave the harmony and I want you to go into the chaos. I want you to leave the beautiful and I want you to go into the ugly. I want you to leave the majestic and I want you to enter the muck heap. I want you to leave paradise and I want you to show up in a cow shed in the Middle East. And because the Father loved the Son and because the Son loved the Father, the Son was obedient. I'll go. I'll go. But not only that, as if that weren't enough, he became an infant with nothing, able to do nothing. You know the nativity story. To say nothing, to be humiliated, to be helpless, to take on flesh, to become one of us. Why? Why would he do that? One word. Agape. Love. Sacrificial love. He demonstrated heaven. He demonstrated the character of God. He fully sacrificed and gave himself to this incredible rescue mission. He came to bring us life. It's why we're called Life Church, because that's what Jesus came to bring us. Full life, cleaned life, heaven's life, eternal life. He came to bring us life. And then in the very next verse, John begins to describe something of this agape, sacrificial love, and how it reaches its pinnacle in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, John says this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Well, friends, if the last verse was a mighty one, this is a magnificent one. Because this verse is the good news verse. This is the verse that has the gospel at its heart. This is the verse that if you see it for yourself and you understand God's love for you personally, if this verse gets a hold of you in your head and in your heart, you will never be the same again. You thought you were just coming to a meeting this morning and in this moment God's love can come to you and completely transform everything you've ever thought, said or done and can completely change your destiny in this moment. In fact, I'm believing God for that. Some of you today, for the first time, are going to say, I want to be loved like that. This is love, says John. I mean, I don't know where you've looked for love before. But this is love. This is love. You know, wherever you may have fallen, wherever you may have failed, whoever may have disappointed you or let you down, this is love. This is, John's saying, the authentic thing. Where everything else is a pale shadow. Where everything else is a fraudulent love. This is the true love. This is the real love. This is, I don't know, the real deal in the words of David Dickinson. The real deal. This is authentic love unshakable, real, true, unchangeable, unwarranted, inexhaustible love of God. You see, and John says it wasn't so much about us loving God. We all thought we chose this, didn't we? We thought this was something, yeah, actually I want to be a God lover. 
I say, no. John flips it on his head. It was about him loving us all along. And as if coming on that journey from the perfection of heaven to the pollution of earth and, and, and taking on the form of a human, as if that wasn't enough, John tells us here that he did something more to actually achieve our redemption and our rescue and our freedom, how he bore our freedom. He found a way to forgive us, those who had fallen, and then welcome them into the beauty of what the Father and the Son and the Spirit have enjoyed for all eternity. He found a way to include us in heaven's story, to include us in the perfection of agape love, eternal love. He found a way for us who were fallen, broken, sinful, damaged to enter into the perfect, to take the opposite journey that Jesus had taken from heaven to earth and to take us from earth to heaven. This, if you get it, let me tell you, it's incredible. It's genuinely life-changing. You see, coming wasn't enough. Just arriving wasn't enough. It wouldn't have been enough to redeem us, to pay the price for our brokenness and our sin. For God's work, there had to be an ultimate sacrifice. Blood had to be shed, just as it had throughout all of Old Testament history. A lamb had to be sacrificed to enable us to be cleansed and to be made righteous. And Jesus, in the flesh, became that lamb. Jesus became that sacrifice. He went like a lamb to the slaughter. And on a rubbish dump outside of Jerusalem, he paid the ransom price. Having his body nailed to a Roman cross, having been mocked and mercilessly humiliated. Not only that, in that moment, he experienced a pain that none of us will now ever have to experience if we put our trust in that one act. You see, what he experienced was a complete separation from agape, a complete separation from that perfect Trinitarian love that he'd always been included in. In that moment, he felt the abandonment of carrying my sin and your sin into his own body. He felt something he'd never experienced before, alienation from the perfection that he'd always experienced. And in that moment, he bore God's wrath for us. In that moment, God's wrath was turned away from you and I and turned on to himself. And instead of me bearing the anger of God on my lust and my pride and my greed and my envy, I, the one who should have been in prison, gets to go free. As do you, the moment you put your trust in him. You see, John says he atoned for our sin. Now, to atone for something means not only do you recognize that something has gone wrong, but you do something practical to put right that which has caused division and breakdown of relationship. So let's imagine in your household there's a stroppy teenager and they have a tantrum. And then a few hours later they come skulking out of their bedroom and they realize they've really upset you. And so they say, look, mum, I'm really sorry. I, I know I shouldn't have said that. I'll tell you what. Let me cook tea and do the washing up tonight. You see, what they're doing is they are atoning for their sin. They're trying to do something that will not only just show that they've got it wrong, but they will then seek to restore the relationship by a positive act to put it right. And in a way, this is something like what God did in Jesus, but the beauty of it is this. You and I were the offending teenager. But he did the work of atonement. Now that is the essence of grace. We did the wrong thing, but he did the thing to put it right again. He took the initiative. He brought the restoration. He brought the redemption. He gave us everything. This is grace. And in turning away God's wrath from us who so thoroughly deserved it, he did the most incredible thing, which was demonstrate 
agape to us. Not just now existing within the Trinity, but coming to you and I. You see, if you were to sum up what did the cross mean? What did the cross demonstrate? Love. Pure, unimaginable love. Not as a concept, as an action. So when we say Jesus died for me, Jesus actually died for me. For you. For anyone who would put their trust in that completed work on the cross and receive the forgiveness that came with it. He loved me. Enough to die for me. And now, what do I get? I get the journey back, the reverse, the return trip. Jesus took the outward journey. I take the return journey. Eternally now, I get to enjoy the love that the Trinity have enjoyed forever. Now I get to know when this life is over and I see him face to face and I'll be like him. I'll be welcomed in to that relationship of love and sacrifice and beauty and purity, heaven, Eden, new heavens, new earth, no sin, no sorrow, no compromise, no frustration, no harsh words, no sickness, no broken relationships. I get that because he loved me. How can we not be thankful? That's what our God is like. Not angry. Not ugly. Not some garish representation of a power crazed needing to be placated God. Our God died for us. Pure, unimaginable love. And I want you to be able to receive it. Because it changes everything. Now some of you have, you know God loves you, but you've been living like an orphan, you've been living like you're unloved, you've been living like he, this hasn't worked for you. And this is what I want to say to you, receive it again today. As we take communion together, which you'll find your communion cups, there's a wafer in there under your, under your seats. We'll do it together in a moment as we close. But I want you to take that as a moment to say, no, this is true. I want to re-believe this today, that this love is available to me right now. And I want to live my life in the security and the knowledge that Jesus has done everything for me. And I want to receive that love. And listen, some of you today are going to receive this love for the first time. And I just want to pray a prayer. And after I've prayed this prayer, this is a prayer that you're saying, yeah, I want to receive this love. I'm believing in the cross and I want to receive this love. Having prayed that prayer and meaning it from your heart, then you can also take the bread and the wine. If, if you would say, actually, I'm not a believer and I don't believe any of this, please, can I ask you, just don't take it because it means a lot. You can tell. This is, this is a God man who died for us. So please wait until you're a believer until you take this. Because it's not just a plastic cup. It represents for us a sacrifice. And a love like no other. But what will give us the greatest joy is if you discovered that for yourself today. Can I just ask, can I just ask, before I pray, can I just ask everyone to bow their heads for a moment? And if you today would like to receive the love of God and the forgiveness from the cross, and you want to receive this love for yourself, can I ask you just to raise your hand where you are? And I'm just going to pray a prayer from the front here. I'm not going to ask you to move or single you out or do anything, but I want you to receive it. So just stick your hand up really quickly if that's you, and then I'll pray, and then we can take the bread and the wine together. Thank you. Well done. Anybody else today that wants to pray and receive this pure, perfect love like no other? Thank you. Well done. I'm just going to give it a moment because it's a big call. I can tell you, your life won't be the same again. Okay, just pray this with me then. Thank you that you are a God of love. 
I receive your love. Jesus, thank you that you love me enough to go to the cross in order to atone for my sin and bring me home. I love you and I'm excited about the future. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit and lead me into eternity, beginning today. Amen. And listen, you, if, if you're a Christian today and you think, actually, today I want to remind myself of the love of God and the, I want the Holy Spirit to testify with my spirit that I am actually a child of God and I am actually his and this deal has been done and it's real and it's true and it's secure. Listen, can you just raise your hand if you want to receive that truth afresh in your life today? And I'm just going to, again, pray and then we'll take the bread and the wine. Well done. Just identify yourself so that you'll say, yeah, no, I really, I really do believe this stuff. Yeah, well done. Come on. Lord Jesus, we, we, we say this is true. This is God revealed to us, a sacrificial lamb. And we receive again the love that came through that cross, that agape love. Holy Spirit, come right now and bring us the assurance and the peace that tells us that we are yours forever. Let's just open our, the top layer of our communion cups and let's just take the bread together. And Timo, would you like to come up and, and play and then we'll finish with a song in a moment. But let's just... Jesus, we, rec we, we recognise that this small token really does represent your body that was broken for us. Lord, this means so much to us. Jesus, we want to thank you for dying and for being broken so that we could be healed. We receive this and believe again that the cross was enough, that you achieved the very thing the Father sent you for and that we now get wonderfully included. And in your own time, feel free to take the lid off your cup and remember the cup of suffering. Remember the blood that was spilled. the death that was so cruelly meted out on our Jesus. Yet it's that very act that brought us life. It's that very blood that cleansed us and made a way for us to be connected with all of heaven's beauty for eternity. But we drink this in gratitude for who you are and for what you've done.